Great. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sherry Larkins. I'm with the University of California, Los Angeles, and I uh, am part of the International Technology Transfer Center projects, and I'm thrilled to have two of uh, my colleagues from Vietnam uh, that I've worked with previously present some of their really compelling uh, research data and information uh, from uh, their uh, time in Vietnam and the work that they've been doing in Vietnam. And uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Tran, who is the De Deputy Director of the Department of Science and Technology at Haiphong Union Sciences Technology Association in Vietnam. She was a Humphrey Fellow here in the United States and uh, is currently working at University of South Florida and is a UNODC Global Demand Reduction Trainer. So welcome, Dr. Tran. And um, also Dr. Ziep, who is somebody that I've worked with for many years, who uh, received her PhD from UCLA, and I had the pleasure of working with her while she was here, but also in her role at the uh, ITTC in Vietnam, previously the, uh, the Vietnam HIV uh, uh, ATTC. So um, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Tran, if you would like to share your slides and set us up with an introduction, and then we will get also then to the specific project that uh, Dr. Ziep is uh, working on as well. So thank you so much. So um, hello, everyone. Sherry, I actually have a favor to ask. I've been trying yes. to open up my slides, and it won't allow me to upload it. So can you please uh, use the backup version, and I will and share your screen. Great. Let me open it up. OK. Sorry about that. Is um, sorry about that. I apologize. Maybe we can um, there we go. Are you able to see the slides? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see. Right. Now. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, um, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure for me to share our research work. And our study is entitled Substance Use Among Veteran Patients in Vietnam, a Systematic Review. Um, this presentation comprises of five main parts. Um, Cherry, can you have? Yeah, perfect. Um, introduction methods, findings, discussion, and limitations. To start off, I could like to provide an introduction to this study. As you all might know that uh, iPod Miss You is a global issue, and the number of people who miss you iPods double from 31 to 60 million in over about 10 years, with iPod overdose deaths are rising in many countries. Um, one of the countries that has a very high rate um, of iPod misuse is Vietnam. The country Vietnam has confronted the issue of iPod misuse for years, and it is estimated that among people who um, use substance, about 85% misuse iPod, which result in multiple long-lasting consequences, such as HIV pandemic, high rate of HCV, overdose deaths, and treatment admissions. And when it comes to treatment for iPod uh, addiction, methadone has been proven to be safe and effective when used as prescribed. Uh, methadone is a long-acting synthetic and full agonist drug that developed in the U.S. in the 1950s. Despite the fact that methadone being available in the U.S. since the 1970s, methadone only became available in Vietnam in 2008. And methadone was piloted in three methadone clinics at first um, countrywide, then expanded to all provinces and cities in the nation, serving more than um, 30,000 patients. 
And when patients enroll methadone treatment, we hope that they stop using the drugs, right? But in cases they do use, we need to have a good understanding of their use. So we see that substance use during methadone has been documented in previous studies. And substance use um, during methadone treatment is risky due to the dangerous drug interactions. Uh, for example, mixing methadone with other opioids can increase the risk of low blood pressure, overdose, and death. Um, another example, uh, when using alcohol and marijuana while in methadone treatment, we deplete the methadone in the body, causing the patient to receive less than their full dose. Um, substance use during methadone is associated with poor treatment outcomes and dropping out of treatment too. Um, up to date, there's a lack of a complete picture of substance use pattern in uh, among methadone patients in Vietnam. So this is when our study came into play. Our study was conducted to answer the research questions. What are the types of substance that the patients use? What are the substance use prevalence among them? And what are the knowledge gap, the knowledge gaps regarding substance use pattern? So we conducted uh, this review to answer these questions. Um, now let's talk about um, how we conduct this study. This systematic review was conducted using guidelines such as uh, the Campbell Collaboration to conduct a review and the PRISMA guideline to report the findings. So first we identify the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Then we conduct the searches in four databases. And based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we select the studies for data extraction and quality assessment. And then we report the, the findings. Um, perhaps I should skip these um, details. If anyone has a question later, I'm happy to answer. Um, so I want to show you the Prisma flow diagram um, because this diagram allows us to describe, describe how we come up with uh, how we came up with a final list of the included study for the findings. So after conducting um, searches in four databases. 162 records were identified. After removing all duplications and records that did not meet the inclusion criteria, 30 records were left for full text review. Eventually, 20 studies were kept for data analysis. Data were imported to COVID and software for screening and analyzing. All steps were conducted by two um, orders independently, me and Dr. Rick and all conflicts were thoroughly discussed until they were resolved. Um, let's move to the findings here. In this slide, we have a box and whisker diagram that shows the substance use prevalent rates. Each box represents the rate of each substance with the range and average. So for example, if you can see here, the blue box shows the alcohol use rate with an average of 47% and reported in 10 studies. Second, the orange box shows the tobacco use with an average of 81% reported in eight studies. Heroin use rate was reported in the yellow box with an average of 32% reported in eight studies. And injection drug use rates were reported in the light orange box with an average of 24% uh, reported in 11 studies. Last, the white box shows the rate of illicit drug use with an average of 12% reported in 10 studies. So given the, the data, we conclude that substance use among methadone patients is an acting is active issue with a high risk rate of alcohol, tobacco, and heroin. Findings from our study suggested some directions for uh, future practice and policy. First, um, given the fact that the high rates of tobacco and alcohol use, it is suggested that the treatment and intervention for these substances should be offered to medical patients, such as treatment for alcohol use disorders and smoking succession programs. Second, patients who were newly admitted to treatment had a very high rate of heroin use. Therefore, they should be closely monitored and for heroin use and overdose. Also, we hope that, as I said, we hope that patients 
uh, stop using drugs after enrolling treatment, but however, if they decide to keep using, harm to reaction strategies should be discussed here. For example, we could offer um, sterilized injection equipment such as uh, needles and syringes should be offered to patients to mitigate the HIV transmissions, and providers should also be uh, educate patients on alternate routes of administration because um, injecting drugs is associated with the highest risk of um, for overdose and death compared to other routes of administration. Uh, also, many patients, even they use heroin for a long time, they were not aware of a safe way to inject drugs. For example, uh, proper legal cleaning to avoid infection. And in these cases, providers should consider offering education on safe injecting practices. Uh, for future research, we suggest that um, there's a need for future research to work um, to investigate for the substance use of methadone patient in different settings using a consistent, the consistent measurements across drug types. And also while reviewing the included study, we noticed that there's a very small proportion of female patients in methadone. And the reason for this remains unclear. Therefore, we encourage future research to pay special attention to women in methadone treatment for a better understanding this low number and its associated factors. Um, there's also a possibility that substance use patterns differ among patients in rural areas and urban areas. Um, therefore, um, future research should look into this also. Uh, last, qualitative research is needed to contextualize our finding. So we provide uh, the numbers, but then we need, we need to have a deep, uh, deeper understanding and contextualize why this has happened in a specific uh, context of Vietnam or elsewhere. Um, so to provide a deeper understanding and um, because this is an IT issue of um, patients in Vietnam right now. Um, this review has several real, real, uh, limitations. First, we did not uh, conclude the, the um, great literature, such as government reports, unpublished um, studies, dissertations, or non-English studies. So we are um, missing that part. And second, in some cases, the, the time frame of substance use were not specifying, but rather indicated as current use. Additionally, some study only asked participants about the classes of drug they were using, for example, arbors, rather than like the specific drugs like heroin. So um, another limitation is that the studies um, examine concurrent drug use and illicit drug use through yes, no questions. So it was difficult for us to get a clear picture of all types and drugs being used and to what extent. So those are some of the limitations of our review. Um, and that was the last slide of my presentation. Thank you for um, everyone so much for your attention. And I'm ready to take up any question you may have later on in the section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tran. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate uh, your, your thorough overview. That was excellent. I'm going to stop sharing and I will allow Dr. Ziep to share and talk about a specific project that she and her team at Hanoi Medical University have been working on. Um, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see them now. It, it, yeah, okay. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So, first of all, I would like to thank ICUDR for the great chance for us to share our work with you. And our Vietnam ITTC and Hanoi Medical University have a strong collabor collaboration with the Vietnam Ministry of Health in providing training and technical support for the providers working in the addiction field in Vietnam. We also have experience in conducting research to provide evidence to develop the sound policy for people who use drugs. And in 2021, Vietnam started pilot the methadone take home program and the Ministry of Health invited us to evaluate the result and to provide information for the decision of the next plan of implementation. 
So today I'm going to share the result with you. As Dr. Chum mentioned in her presentation, uh, Vietnam started pilot methadone maintenance treatment in 2008 in two big cities and decided to scale up nationwide two years later. After seeing the good result of the pilot program, after that, the number of treatment facility and patients increased sharply just in a few years from 2011 to 2017. However, in the past five years, the number of patients remained stable and, and even uh, decreased a bit, and it achieved only 65% of the government's um, target in 2015. This suggests that there are challenges uh, in access to care for new patients and also maintaining care for patients under treatment. And the COVID-19 brought even more challenges to the methadone system, especially in daily dosing for patients in the clinic uh, during the social distance time and provide medication for patients who are in quarantine. And you can see on the slide some picture of how we dispense methadone during the COVID time and how we ship the methadone dose for patients who are quarantined at home or the quarantine centers. And in uh, to cope with this situation, um, the Ministry of Health uh, decided to start the pilot take-home program in April 2020 in two mountainous areas, uh, which is Điện Biên and Lai Châu, and one um, urban city, which is Hải Phòng. And after our first round of evaluation, uh, the Ministry of Health has decided to scale up the pilot to six provinces in early 2022. And by the end of 2022, there were more than 3,000 of patients uh, receiving methadone take-home dosing in the own six provinces. And in uh, the upper picture, uh, you can see it the program kick-off uh, ceremony. And the lower picture was the bottle and the bag um, that uh, uh, contain the medication. And I would like to share some key points of the treatment guideline of the take-home program. First of all, patients could be considered for the take-home if they are stable uh, in the treatment. For example, they remain at a maintenance dose, no drug use, um, no dose missing for at least two months. And they have to have family support and have a safe place to store medication at home. And some priority criteria you know, including they have to have uh, um, live in the remote area with difficulties in transportation, have a stable job or have a smartphone with internet connection. And these criteria uh, could be decided by each uh, clinic and province. And the eligibility of uh, patients uh, will be evaluated by the treatment team on a monthly basis. An eligible patient will uh, be provided with an initial counseling and then they will provide written consent uh, before receiving the take-home dosing. And in the first month, a uh, patient will take one dose in front of the provider and, in, uh, and take one dose home. And from the second month, they could bring two doses home and then increase at maximum two doses per month if they are doing well in treatment. And from month six, a uh, patient can bring maximum 10 doses home. And also monitoring is required to determine the patient's level of adherence. The monitoring content includes uh, inspecting patient's home environment, ensuring proper drug storage and support patient in treatment adherence. And the monitoring can be conducted in person at patient homes or at clinic or by social platform. And for the frequency during the first uh, three months, uh, they are required to have monitoring at least two times per month, and later on at least once per month. And if patient fail to comply with the treatment adherence or refuse to take urine tests or have a positive urine test or lose their take-home medication or store it in an unsafe place, so they will have to uh, stop the privilege of uh, take-home and then they will be back to the daily dosing at the clinic. And this study was conducted to assess the feasibility, acceptability, and treatment outcomes of the pilot program. We use mixed methods 
uh, which combine the quantitative data and qualitative data collection. The quantitative data were extracted from the medical record of nearly 1,900 patients who ever received or are waiting for the take-home program. And the qualitative data was collected from the provincial leaders, the MNT providers, the patients who received a take-home dose and their family members. And now, uh, and as of the, uh, our data collection time, uh, September 2022, Half of patients uh, are eligible for the take-home program, and among them, um, more than 90% uh, have joined the program. And the retention rate in the take-home program after 17 months was 94%. And now let's come to the results of our evaluation. The retention in methadone treatment in general after 17 months was 90%. And this retention rate were much higher than the global average in the systematic review in 2020 and the retention rate in MNT program in Hanoi in 2021. And the patient currently uh, receiving take-home doses have better retention compared to those who have never been in the program and those who ever been in the program in the past, but not currently. And it suggests that the um, take-home program may have to uh, improve the treatment retention. And regarding the treatment adherence, among those who have been followed up in up 12 months before and after participating the take-home program, the risk of missing dose uh, decreased significantly. And, uh, and uh, you can see on the chart and uh, the program that now uh, have to improve the treatment adherence of the patient as well. And now come to the patient's feedback uh, for the program. Uh, in general, the patient really appreciate the take-home program and they expect their high satisfaction. And in the index interviews, they emphasize that the benefit of the take-home program in enabling the treatment adherence uh, increase their employment opportunity and improve their health status and family relationship. And here are some quotes of the patient opinions uh, you can uh, look on the screen. Uh, however, they still need more support to ensure the treatment adherence. For example, some patients uh, they are doing very well in treatment, but they can still uh, forgot to take the medication uh, occasionally, especially when they are busy with their, their job. And uh, in addition, some patients uh, have difficulties in paying for the medication container when they receive the take-home dosing, and especially for those who are poor and living in the remote area with pretty low uh, social economic uh, status. And regarding the provider's uh, perspective, um, they also acknowledge the benefits of the take-home program. And they share that the take-home program not only good for patients who are on the program, but also for others, because they have uh, strong, uh, stronger motivation to do well on treatment, uh, to receive the take-home dosing. And, uh, but however, the, their workload would, was not reduced as our uh, initial expectation of the program due to the added requirement for administration work and the medication monitoring uh, that I mentioned before. And monitoring is the most uh, challenging in the remote area where providers have difficulty in getting to patient home and uh, using the visual monitoring. Uh, because some patients they uh, may not have smartphone and they have poor internet connection, uh, especially when they are working in, uh, on the mountainous farm. So it's very difficult for them to, to receive a phone call uh, with internet. So in conclusion, uh, the pilot program has shown uh, promising results in terms of both feasibility and acceptability, and as well as the treatment retention and adherence. And relaxing various requirements would have reduced the provider's work burden, therefore would facilitate the expansion and the sustainability of the program. 
And for your update information, uh, our Ministry of Health are working on uh, revising the treatment guideline and also prepare the legal documents to include the uh, take-home dosing as a treatment option in the regular treatment guideline for methadone treatment. And we hope that and looking forward to our national scale up uh, in the next couple of years. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ziep. Very uh, interesting. Um, I'm going to open it up to see if anybody has questions. They're welcome to either unmute themselves or put questions in the chat. In the meanwhile, I do have one question for Dr. Ziep because you mentioned that the Vietnam, the Ministry of Health is considering uh, changing regulations or uh, adding to the regulations to allow for uh, take home as an option. Ha are after the pilot completed, did uh, is there any access to take home at the moment, even those who were currently enrolled, or has that stopped altogether until the regulations are changing? Thank you, Sherry, for for your question. So um, after we uh, finish our evaluation, we have uh, present our result in a national conference to inform the Ministry of Health about the result of the evaluation. And after that, the um, discussion and agree that the, um, the program should be expanded nationwide. Um, however, they, they, they still require a, a period of time for them to prepare all the, all the formal documents. For example, um, the treatment guideline for methadone treatment, they, they are a decision in the law of Vietnam. So it takes some time for them to train the law and the, the treatment guideline. However, they are now within have six provinces to implement the pilot program and they still scale up um, in the six provinces. At first, they pilot in uh, just a certain small number of uh, treatment facilities, but now they scale up to the whole provinces. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I, and another question was, um, you mentioned that the there was an expectation that the workload would be streamlined, but it turned out that it actually providers said it was it increased their workload. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So has uh, the has have there been plans made to consider how to implement this? without it being such a burdensome workload. It seems like it's been benefiting patients, but for providers themselves, it seems like it was uh, a lot of work to go out and, and dispense and provide in, in provinces and mountainous areas. Is there a plan for how you may be able to take this to scale or scale it up without a heavy labor burden? Yeah. So at first, when they start pilot the program, so the Ministry of Health, they expect that instead of seeing patients uh, daily, for example, 300 patients daily, so they now they reduce the number of patients by uh, providing the take-home dosing. Um, but the, the, the problem making the uh, workload is not um, reducing because of the, of the system of managing all the administ right. administration work. So for the daily dosing, they they uh, they manage on the um, administrative work on an electronic system, uh, but unfortunately for now the uh, daily dosing they are not uh, included in the system yet, and uh, this is the most uh, uh, complaint that the provider made to the the ministry of health, and they are working to to work on that. And I think after they resolve that problem that include all the administrative work of the take home dosing into the current system. So the workload uh, of the provider could be reduced significantly. Great. Um, I do have a question for Dr. Zia, uh, because this study is very interesting for me. I see the patients every day and they talk about like take home methadone and I, I, I look forward uh, to hearing the, the findings of your study. And I do have a question. So you said uh, during the pilot period, you have the sponsor, sponsorship 
that for the bags and the box for the medication, right? So it's not on the uh, patient's burden. Uh, however, in the future, do you have any kind of general idea that how much it can cost if they have to get it themselves when there's no more funding? And if you are aware of any co-pay mechanism that the government is considering to support the patient? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chum. It's a great uh, question, but it's also a topic that um, usually mentioned um, in our discussion with the Ministry of Health um, and uh, in working with uh, the international organization that's sponsored for the for the pilot program. And they uh, they um, for now several options uh, are being discussed. So they try to lower the price of the bottle. Uh, for now, it's um, I it's estimate that. Um, patient, if they have to pay, so they can pay about three to five dollars uh, per month for the cost of the bottle. Um, even if it's not a big amount of money, but it's been uh, a lot for many patients, especially who, who are poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Ministry of Health also considered to uh, to try the, the tablet one, um, the, the tablet methadone. So in this case, so they do not have to have the bottle to contain uh, the medication. Also, they still worry about the misuse of uh, methadone, uh, but uh, uh, it's the kind of uh, consider between the pros and cons of each uh, option to have the final decision. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. It's very informative. That kind of leads to two questions together that I had about stigma and, you know, kind of how people are perceived who, um, you know, I worked in a nonprofit treatment center for a long time here in the United States in Florida, and there was definitely stigma about, you know, well, you're just, you're just trading in one drug for another. And so I'm wondering what you guys have seen in terms of stigma in your work and if you have had any opportunity to, you know, to some extent combat that. And then the other question is related to what you were just discussing um, about different options. So, you know, I was just reading an article this morning about buprenorphine. And I know there's Suboxone and, you know, different options. So I'm wondering if you have any opinions on those. Thank you. And that would be for either either doctor, Dr. Tran, as well as Dr. Ziep. Any experience with, with stigma uh, that you've seen as well as um, some potential for buprenorphine or uh, alternatives to methadone? Yeah, so um, earlier last year, we also conducted a study focusing on like um, participants, methadone patients uh, approaches to methadone treatment. So we have have um, a little bit of understanding how they perceive receiving methadone treatment as a medication and uh, how much they are comfortable with having this medication instead of using drugs, right? So it's kind of a mix, I have to say mix sharing, but I would say the findings lean towards positive feelings towards methadone treatment versus negative. So methadone patients themselves from the findings, um, if we uh, I have another opportunity, I would share about that, but I'm just sharing from my personal experience that they seem to have positive feelings and attitude towards methadone treatment um, because they consider it as a, a treatment, a medication, not another type of drugs. However, in society, I think there's a still mixed uh, conceptions, uh, of course. So they, people might think that a patient have to come to clinic every day, take the medication every single day, like they have to use drugs every day. So, but when we, uh, that's when I, that's why I think education is really important because even though they take uh, medication every day, it's a completely different thing. So, like you treat uh, diabetes, you treat um, heart disease, right? All chronic disease, you have to take medication every day. And the things that the medication um, do to your body is different from the drugs to your body, right? So, we're trying to also advocate for education and training at a very community level um, 
to uh, to raise uh, raise their awareness of um, the differences and the science of, of addiction and 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 um, and uh, recovery. So it's just some of my thoughts. Great, thank you, Dr. Tran. Dr. Ziep. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Dr. Chum that I observe the same thing. We often ask the the patient about the stigma with the methadone treatment uh, when we conducting study uh, among methadone patients. And uh, I observe uh, the same thing that uh, some patients do not feel uh, stigmatized uh, towards their, their methadone treatment, while uh, others, they, they try to hide um, their treatment status by uh, going to the clinic that are far away from their home uh, to receive the treatment. Uh, so it is not, 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 uh, not clear as the for, for the whole population um, and for, for the second question about the other option um, for example the pupenoxin so for Vietnam in the past we have like two big um, clinical trials um, to use uh, bupenoxin uh, including the suboxone and the uh, bupenoxin uh, no for the trial we use uh, suboxone um, one in the north and one in the south. Um, and then after we show some uh, promising results for the treatment, uh, the Ministry of Health agreed to pilot and then have scale up uh, the buprenorphine treatment to seven provinces um, in the past. But unfortunately, like two or three years ago, they stopped uh, the program. Um, due to the uh, high uh, cost of the uh, buprenorphine. Uh, and uh, from the patient perspective, and uh, many of them are doing very well on buprenorphine, and they are really sad that uh, they cannot um, under the treatment of buprenorphine and have to switch to, to methadone after that. And um, another option is that uh, in terms of medication is the um, is the naltrexone um, uh, tablet, and uh, it's not as common as the buprenorphine and methadone, but uh, they do uh, provide that option in the uh, psychiatrist hospital. A uh, paper can use it for a short time, but not for for maintenance treatment. Great, thank you, Doctor Ziab. Excellent. Well, I don't see any um, questions from our folks. Everyone's being quiet on the uh, participant side, but um, I just want to thank you so much for this really important information. I think, um, you know, we need to continually make sure people understand this topic and the benefits and from a public health standpoint, from a recovery standpoint, and um, we feel really grateful at ICU DDR to have two such uh, esteemed doctors to work with us on this. So we're really grateful. And um, as I'm sure Sherry mentioned earlier, we will have this posted, the recording, so that we can share it with others who weren't able to be here and can watch it on demand. And um, if people ask, are we able to share your PowerPoints? Sure. Sure. Yeah. sure. Okay. Great. Sometimes people are need that time to digest it and look through all the data. So wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. We're so grateful Thank you, everyone. and Thank I you. hope that we will get to work together again soon. Thank you everyone. Thank Thanks you, everyone. for all your help. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.